But what Greg was beginning to see was that it's the students themselves who are saying, you can't say that. Stop her from saying that. We need rules to stop him from yeah. saying that. And that's what was new. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV. Today we're talking with John Haidt. He is a social psychologist at the NYU Stern School of Business. John, thanks for talking to us. My pleasure, Nick. You have uh, obviously have a fantastic academic uh, reputation, uh, which precedes uh, anything we're doing here. But also, along with Greg Lukianoff, the uh, co-director, co uh, the director of Fire Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. A couple of years ago, you wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, which really brought a lot of the issues you're interested in to a much broader audience. Um, let's talk about Campus PC and where it comes from, um, because this is the world we live in. It helped empower Donald Trump. Uh, he, he ran for president saying, I was against PC. Right. What Define uh, and kind of quantify how we know that political correctness is getting bigger or worse on college campuses, that speech is actually being shut down, thought is being shut down. Right. Um, so it, it's hard to find, it, so this is all so new. There's been, I believe, a kind of a moral revolution, a new moral culture emerging on campus, but it really is only in the last two years. So uh, if any of your viewers graduated from college in 2013, they probably haven't seen it. Um, so there was a kind of a culture, we can talk about it in a moment, but it's organized around, around victims of oppression. It's a, it's a vertical metaphor of, of privileged and oppressor people and, and victims. And this idea that everything is power, right. you know, it goes back a long way. I mean, students are always at risk of being told, everything is power. No, everything is money. No, everything is sex. So we've had these you know, one-dimensional moral cultures for a long time. But they were limited to certain departments on campus at certain schools. But something began happening in 2014, 2015, where we just started hearing all these stories. Right. So when Greg and I wrote the article, it was just there were all these amazing, shocking stories of students. What's an example of one? Uh, well, it's, you know, one of the ones we tell in the paper that everybody, everybody knows. Uh, Jeannie Souk at Harvard uh, wrote about how in her law school classes, students wouldn't let her, uh, there were, students were objecting to her saying violated, like that violated the law. Mm -hmm. Because violation, well, that could trigger a thought of rape. And we can't let a student who's been raped think about rape. And so, you know, while there's a certain logic to that, it also, and this was the point of the article, the more you teach people to think that way, that hearing a trigger will reactivate, you're actually hurting them when you do that. So um, we're finding more and more professors saying, wait, I I'm doing just what I've always done, but suddenly the students are freaking out and they're reporting me to the dean. So uh, when we wrote the article, it was, it was all just anecdotes. Right. Uh, but that was in August of 2015. That was before the big blow up. It was really um, in the fall of 2015, you get the Missouri protests and then especially Yale. Right. So again, it's after the Yale protests that everything really spreads. And that was, that was like 13 or 14 months ago. So we don't and have that, good data. And that in the Yale video, uh, there was, a, a, I guess, a... a Nicholas Christakis. The yeah, poster. but I mean, yeah. just that primal scene really of where a student is saying, this is not an intellectual space. This is a safe space or something along those lines so that you have this paradigmatic example of somebody at one of the, you know, considered one of the best colleges in the, in the country, shockingly given what's going on there, but, uh, you know, like, hey, you know, uh, you know, get out of my mind here. Yeah. This is pretty mm -hmm. stunning. So, right. so there, isn't, um, there isn't really a way to quantify other than to say this stuff seems to be going on more and more. Yeah, within a year, I'm sure there will be surveys. Yeah. Oh, actually, you know what? We are creating a survey. Mm -hmm. So at Heterodox Academy, it's a collection. We have uh, 400 professors who've signed on mm -hmm. to say that we think that we need viewpoint diversity. We think right. that no university should be politically homogeneous. Uh, we're, we're creating a bunch of products that we think will help uh, address these problems. And the first thing we need is good data. We're mostly social scientists. So we're creating something called the Fearless Speech Index. It's a simple survey. You come to our site, you get your own link, you send it out, and you can find out who is afraid of speaking openly, right. on what topics, and why. Is it because you're afraid the professor will retaliate or because other students will? So uh, we're just pilot testing it now, but uh, by April, we should have it up on the website. So anybody who wants to do a survey at your own school, mm -hmm. go to heterodoxacademy.org, you'll find a link, and then you'll find out. 
Um, you know, maybe it's that the, you know, the, for example, the men, what I'm finding when I talk, the men are often very quiet during my talks. They don't ask questions, they just sit there. But afterwards, they come up to me like they were you know, abused spouses or something. Right. Because at some schools, the men feel as though they can't speak. And then they go and vote for Trump. So, you know, let's take it back a little bit and talk about the, the causes. Uh, you know, first off, is this, uh, in, in a lot of the examples you used in the Atlantic article, and, and I'm sure in your forthcoming book, it seems to be driven by students. Yes. In other cases, it's driven by professors. Sometimes it's administrators. Mm -hmm. um, you know, residence life has become a bigger and bigger part That's of right. many people's yeah. uh, college experience, and they have all sorts of speech and behavior codes. But if we go back a couple of decades, because the term political correctness kind of first burst onto the consciousness in the very late 80s, very early 90s. There was a New York Magazine story talking about it. I went to, I went to both undergrad and grad school in the early 90s, um, and I, I felt like I saw a shift between about when I graduated college as an undergrad in 85 and when I finished grad school around 93. Things That's have right. become... That's exactly the same time yeah. for me. So, it, I mean, things have become more restricted in the sense that there was uh, a political code or that... that and I, I was in literature, literary and cultural studies, so it's already politicized, but that only certain viewpoints were acceptable. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it was kind of the teacher saying that. You know, they might have the token weirdo, like, okay, Gillespie, you're... You're going to say Frederick Douglass actually liked wage labor, you know, but he 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 didn't know he didn't know the beauty of socialism, you know, or something. But um, what is the connection? Is there any kind of straight line connection between that earlier form and what we're seeing now? Yeah. So the way I think about it is that there's like all these fuses coming together, and each one was burning separately to some extent, and they all intersected in the fall of 2015. And uh, so one of them is academic trends, <clears throat> so the professoriate. So the professoriate has leaned left in most fields for a long time, right. but it only leaned left. Um, we have, here's where we do have good data. Um, it's in, it, from the early 90s to the late 90s is the big shift. Mm -hmm. um, it's as the greatest generation retires. There were a lot of Republicans in, in that generation, whereas the baby boomers, many of them came rushing to the academy either to avoid the Vietnam War or to study racism. So it's in the 90s that the academy goes from leaning left to being very Fair solidly enough. on yep. the left. So you lose diversity there. Um, and that's also part of why you get this faculty-driven wave of PC in the early 90s. I would also, if I can add to that, uh, just and, and I don't know how far his uh, influence uh, extended outside of literary and cultural studies, although I, I see it a lot in sociology and history, Michel Foucault, when you mentioned right. everything is power. That's right, exactly. Um, and I think he actually is very proto-libertarian in many of his mm -hmm. discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a different yeah. story. But there was no question, we were all Foucauldians. And to yes. we were trained exactly. to look at what, what does this say about power, whatever the text, whatever the area of subject. So I think that's exactly right. There are, again, there's all these fuses coming together. And so one is a sort of a separate um, evolutionary process of ideas about power, privilege, and oppression. And that meets up with, and that's from the humanities, ideas from psychology about trauma, bullying, abuse. Uh, the idea of microaggressions was invented by a psychologist. So you get these Foucauldian ideas, you get these psychological victimhood ideas coming together. Who came up with the microaggression? Uh, to, oh, well, the, the term goes back to the 70s or 80s, but it was popularized in an article in the American Psychologist in 2007. I think his name is Dewald uh, Wu Sing. It's mm -hmm. some, um, um, so that it, it, then the idea gets picked up. Mm -hmm. So you've got this intellectual development. The big surprise, the thing that people were not expecting, was that the students are the ones who are demanding it now. This is what took me and Greg, or took Greg by surprise, because Greg had been fighting all these speech codes, right. all these things imposed by administrators and faculty, right. and the students had always generally wanted more freedom. Right. Yeah. But what Greg was beginning to see was that it's the students themselves who are saying, you can't say that. Stop her from saying that. We need rules to stop him from yeah. saying that. And that's what was new. Yeah, he mentioned, uh, I guess it was at Emory College, um, uh, a, a case where somebody had chalked on, on the yeah. sidewalk, Trump which they did. Yeah, and that what struck him as particularly disturbing about that was it was students calling for the investigation and the suppression of speech. And for him, that was kind of a, a Rubicon that he's very uncomfortable has been crossed. Mm -hmm. That's right. The, a key term here is moral dependency. Uh, the most interesting idea I've come across in, in these years studying it um, 
is the idea of victimhood culture. There's a great paper by two sociologists, uh, Manning and Campbell. If you go to heteroxacademy.org and type in victimhood, you can find our, our abbreviated version. They, they analyze how many cultures used to be honor cultures where a small insult must be attended to by you. You can't go get someone to fight your battles for you. You have your honor. Then we move to a dignity culture. As, as you get more trade, you don't need the honor culture anymore. In a dignity culture, sticks and stones will break my bones. Names will never harm me. I'm not going to make a big deal out of a little thing. I'm just, I'm just going to ignore you. And that is a great way to have diversity. If you have a diverse community, boy, do you want a dignity culture. Because then the little misunderstandings, people overlook them. But what they show is that in some universities, and this is they're writing in 2014, before the blow-up, in some universities, those that are most egalitarian, so it's only the most left-leaning universities, where they're already egalitarian, and there's an authority who can be brought in to punish, to side. Everybody is desperately trying to get prestige by either showing what a victim they are, or by punishing people who they think have harmed victims by getting the administration to come in. So everybody is pitching to the powers that be to come in. Where did this come from? In the 80s and 90s, America changed its parenting. Kids lost unsupervised time. Kids used to have a lot of unsupervised time. You get into fights, you work it out. But because of the fear of child abduction, because of the anti-bullying policies, American child rearing changed so that there's always an adult, and the adult always solves the problems, and the whole point is you want to state your case to get the adult to punish him, and not to, not to let him get the adult to punish me. And so kids haven't had the chance to learn to deal with insults, to learn to be excluded. I mean, we, we all get excluded, and you learn to deal so, with it. So now, are you, is this turning back, or is this putting on a new dress on kind of like the momism movement of the 40s or 50s, or, you know, for, you know if for Freud, mm -hmm. it all goes back to the parents, particularly the mother, it seems. Yeah. Um, what, um, you know, how, it, uh, how, how do you kind of make that statement or, or how do you validate that? And I, when I think I've, I've, you know, I have two, two sons, 15 and 23, and, and my ex-wife and I often talked about how they, they started being put in institutional situations where there was always an adult present and not like, oh, this lady is going to be in the neighborhood. Right. So no, when you get run over by a car, she might hear it, but you're taking them to a place, you drop them off, you sign them in, there's, you know, um, and that's very strange and it's different than the, the childhood that I had, certainly. But does that, um, you know, does it create a social type then? And is that social type, is it capable of either being reformed or does it mean that kids will grow out of it, maybe not at college, but then in the workplace or yeah, in their 30s? Right. Yeah, so, um, right, people are concerned about this for generations. And I think there's no question that life and childhood has gotten more feminized away from the masculine virtues. And in many ways, that's good. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was a lot of bullying yeah. and name calling and... So, you know, to have a general trend that way is probably right and good and inevitable. Right. Um, but I think it can go too far when it encourages moral dependency. Uh, Freud was wrong that everything goes back to the mother. Mm -hmm. Kids' relationships to their parents matter for attachment when they're very young. But when they're in middle school and beyond, the total obsession is the peer group. Kids have to fit into their peer group. So if these norms are peer group wide, and we should bring in social media, take whatever tribalism, groupishness, Virtue signaling, take all the things that people have always done, give 13-year-olds Facebook beginning in 2006, and they're, you know, you're really ramping up the, the, you know, the, the mob punishment, the fear of saying something wrong. Um, so the kids who entered college, so Facebook opened its policy in 26, 2006, so the very first kids who'd been on Facebook since 13 only graduated in 2014. Mm -hmm. So s professors have been encountering these kids who are just really different from the kids they were used to who were born before 1980. Um, and that's, I think, part, it's one of the threads. Right, there's right. all and, these threads And there's together. no, this is not a monocausal explanation. No, right? there's, there's a I, lot can give of, you, yeah. I can give you seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, do you feel, are students, do students see themselves, and, and this goes back to the question of kind of a victim culture, do you think that, and I realize to say the typical student, if, if there is one, but do they see themselves more as individuals, uh, say, than when you and I were growing up? Because, you know, I always kind of felt like I was an individual, and the kids that my, fr uh, my kids, their friends, they seem very individual. Uh, I, and, you know, I, I realize these are ridiculously small samples, 
or examples, but do kids, you know, do they feel less individualized in this that kind I, of culture? That I can't say. I have no idea how they feel about this. Um, I think rather what we can say is that they have been exposed, they've been raised in a moral world that has different pillars than ours. So you and I, I was born in 1963, I presume you were around. Uh, yes, there. exactly. We were raised by people who either fought World War II or at least remembered it. We were raised during the Cold War. We were raised to think that liberty and freedom were really, really important concepts. And boy, they really were. There was the free world and the not free world. Right. It was really clear, liberty matters. And it was American, like we are the pioneers. And what I'm noticing is that now, and actually I can show you data on this, you just do a you know, Google trend search. Um, diversity and inclusion is going up and up and up. That phrase is becoming very, very prominent. Um, and actually even multiculturalism is going down. So diversity and inclusion is becoming primary. Our kids have been raised with such anti-bullying training um, no, you know, if it's Valentine's Day, everyone has to get a we can't have anyone be excluded. So our kids have been raised where liberty and freedom are not really talked about. Like even yeah. China isn't, you know, a slave country. I mean, it's, right. so those liberty doesn't matter as much. Diversity and inclusion is much, much more important than but, we and, ever experienced. And the diversity doesn't extend to say, hey, you know what, we're all different. No, it's, so it's, 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 it's not groups. that diversity. It's, yeah. it's the, the three to six specific groups. That's right. what we mean by diversity. So how do you address that uh, then? I, I guess I have two, uh, two final questions I'm interested in. One is how do you address that kind of, and it's beyond parenting, it's kind of a set of social norms and social cues, but then also specifically at the college level, how has the changing function of college um, affected all of this? Because you know, it's one thing if you're going to college in, in order to get a job, if you're going to college to finish your education so that you can be an informed citizen, um, or if it's, you know, it's like a fancy uh, etiquette school. Right. But right. so, I mean, how, how do you address this um, push on diversity and inclusion in a way that, of course, doesn't mean, okay, now we can finally stop kicking certain groups out of college or anything like that, but how do yeah. we change that in a positive okay, way? Sure, well, so first it's important to realize that this is not happening at most colleges. Mm -hmm. um, any college at which students come to campus, take class and go home, you don't get this right. because they, they're living in multiple moral worlds. Um, if people are different ages, you don't get this. Um, this is only at four-year residential schools where there's a moral world that emerges as these students yeah, this is come like together. The, the kids being shipwrecked in, um, in uh, what's the... Uh, yeah, that uh, we all read, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies, that's you. right. Yes. Yeah. It's Gilligan's um, Island that's right. Except for Gilligan's a bachelor, bachelor degree. Well, yeah, it's, it's Gilligan's Island or Lord of the Flies, right. but with a gigantic staff of therapists and yes. deans around to yeah, make yeah. sure that everybody plays nice. Right. Um, so it's only at the elite schools. Um, and um, so what do you do? Um, well, I think we need to rethink the way that we do diversity training. I think the way that it's often done, given that the evidence suggests diversity training either doesn't work or it can backfire if it's done with hostility. Right. I think we need to recognize that as a country, we are in big trouble. We face an existential threat of coming apart. And this mm -hmm. is now obvious to everybody. And I think that we need to rethink diversity training if you're going to have a multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy, you, you have to get everything right. You have to look at the centrifugal forces blowing us out mm -hmm. and the centripetal forces pulling us together. Uh, so just this morning, uh, Kareth Foster gave a great talk on, on how she does diversity training. She uses humor. You've got to, you've got to get people to be, be a little lighter, mm -hmm. give people the benefit of the doubt, recognize that diversity is difficult, and recognize that political diversity is Every year or decade, political diversity is a bigger divide, and actually racial, you know, we've been making progress yeah. on race and gender uh, and sexual orientation. So a lot of the things we've been focusing on, I mean, fortunately, we're making progress. Mm -hmm. The political divide is now, I believe, the one that's going to do us in. And I think it actually might do us in. I think terrible things can happen in this country. And so that, I mean, it helps both explain why Trump was elected. And, and, and it's not that Trump is the only He's, thing, but that you had yeah. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump who were kind of like equal and opposite versions of themselves. They were very disliked, yeah, I very I wouldn't divisive. say they were quite equal, but yeah, they no, were, no. Yeah. I, I, But, but, but in, I in terms mean, of they, violating democratic yes. norms, Trump yeah. was much further out yeah. than anyone we've ever had. Yeah. But uh, many analysts I've read and spoken to agree, Trump is very much a symptom of what was happening. Yeah. He could not have come in had we not had such dysfunction, animosity, distrust, right. cynicism. 
and then Trump is making those worse right. by violating what were the norms. So we are in big trouble, and we will still be in big trouble once Trump leaves. Um, so I think we need to rethink this, and, and I think a lot of ideas from sort of mid to late 20th century America, uh, Richard Rorty's ideas have been kicking mm -hmm. around, um, Arthur Schlesinger, um, about having, over, having uh, a common in-group identity, a shared identity, I mean, this is basic social psychology. Right. The more you emphasize differences, the more you drive people apart. But is in a weird way, then, is Trump kind of doing that? Because he's defining, he's oh. saying, we're, this is what is American. And it's like, hey, sorry, that means Mexicans, yeah. or at least illegal ones, you're not. I love you when you're here. I mean, in a, in a, this is the negative. I mean, for me, I, I, I see red whenever I hear Schlesinger's name because I don't like consensus anything. But, uh, you know, in okay. terms of it, a common identity, and if you go back yeah. to the 1920s, which was the last time where the U.S. started to shut down mass persistent uh, immigration that mm -hmm. took place right. over decades, right. it was done specifically by defining the American as a non-immigrant. Um, you know, that's right. So there's an active discussion now about nationalism and patriotism. And before Trump was elected, back when we all thought Hillary was going to win, I wrote two essays earlier this year on nationalism. The, the, how the, what we're seeing around the world now is the left-right divide has become the nationalist, the, well, the left is the globalist mm -hmm. versus the nationalist. Right. So this is very much in Europe, it's in a number of yep. countries. And I've been trying to say, because the left tends to reject nationalism, reject patriotism, reject borders, that this is a losing path. You're not gonna win elections. You can't even run a country like that. I've been trying to define healthy, positive forms of nationalism mm -hmm. and patriotism. Right. And for America, it should be easy because it's not racial at all. Yeah, yeah. So America should be really good at doing this, and Britain should be pretty good too. Um, and then Trump comes along, and the first thing he says in his, in his inaugural address is this like ugly, you know, it's yeah. almost a blood and soil patriotism. Yeah. Yeah. I was hoping that he was going to say something like, you know, I've said a lot of things about illegal immigration in this country. But boy, if you came here legally and you're a citizen and you're Mexican, I love you. I'm yeah. your president. Like, I was hoping he was yeah. going to say that, and he could have. But now he's made, you know, just as he's making, you know, PC is his issue, which right. makes it harder for me to criticize PC. Now he's made patriotism his issue, which makes That's it harder a, for me to say patriotism well, is yeah, good. It's like he's got your number. I, <sighs> I, you know, he must be hacking your computer or something. But. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about college and, um, you know, how has... Um, you know, college has changed in the 200 or so years it's really been around times, in the U.S. Yes. And it became fully became a, a mass phenomenon around 1970. That's when a, a majority of high school seniors went on to some form of college. We, we hear now, partly because it's so expensive, mm -hmm. that the stakes are high in college. And that, um, you know, that clearly puts anxiety on parents, on students, on professors. Yep. Uh, there are fewer and fewer tenure track lines, the, the business model of school. How does that affect the campus climate and uh, particularly the issues that you think about and, and what needs to be adjusted there? Yeah, I'm not sure that it affects the campus climate so much right now, but I think it's likely to lead to a huge disruption at some point in the next 10, 15 years. <clears throat> so, you know, if you go back, you know, five years before any of this, the, the intense, you know, PC stuff was happening, uh, once MOOCs started coming out and the cost of college was such an issue, a lot of people were saying it's just a matter of time before there's a big disruption. If college is not delivering the value, if there are alternatives, it's just a matter of time before most schools go out of business. Harvard and Yale, Chicago, right. Stanford, they'll always be there, right. but most schools will go out of business. And I think what's happened is as college has gotten weirder and weirder and all this bad publicity, most people in the country look at the coddling culture, they look at the students protesting, and they're not sympathetic. Many of them are horrified. So I think that's a black mark on, uh, on colleges. And what are they doing to deal with it? A lot of the things that the elite schools are doing to deal with the protests are hiring a lot more administrators and a lot more expensive programs. Mm -hmm. So um, I think they're kind of digging in their own grave a little faster. They're speeding up the time yeah. of the disruption. As soon as someone can come up with a way of actually training or certifying people so that they can actually get jobs, I think colleges are going to face a big loss of market share. Well, and it'll be a shame, too, because, I mean, the liberal arts have always, and particularly the humanities, have always been kind of suspect. Yeah. And those are really, in a lot of ways, that those are the types of um, 
uh, areas, course areas, as well as um, uh, frames of mind that would actually help us navigate a more diverse, That's tolerant right. society exactly. in the best way possible. That's right. It's sort of the classical things that we say, the classical things we say about the liberal arts and a liberal arts education are just what we need now. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you know, my wife uh, went to Smith as an undergrad. She loved it. She loved literature. So she went to the University of Virginia to get a master's degree thinking that she loves literature, let right. me go study literature. And she was so disappointed because it was really more about politics and power and Foucault type. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't about literature. It wasn't liberal arts thinking. It right. was very ideological. Yeah. So, you know, I think, the, I think the humanities have kind of lost credit, and I think it's their own fault. Uh, uh, we will, uh, I, in total agreement, and we will leave it there. Thank you. We've been talking with Jonathan Haidt. He is a social psychologist at New York University's Stern School of Business, and he's the foremost thinker about the coddling of the American mind and what we need to do to address it. John, thanks so much. Nick, my pleasure. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.